All right, well, let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we come to you on this day, and we do thank you once again for your, your marvelous grace, your grace that exceeds all of our guilt and our sin, and your grace which is greater than all that we have done. And it is by the grace that you have given us in Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us and rose again to give us life, that we do come on this day. And we come, O Lord, because of your grace, which is still at work in us, that still works in our hearts even now. Lord, we do pray that you would work in us as we open your word, as we hear it, as we uh, consider it, and Lord, may it take root in our hearts that we may live it in our lives. Lord, we ask that your spirit would work among us, Lord, to strengthen us, to bring glory and honor to your name. Help me, Lord, now as Uh, we look at your word, that I may uh, be able to open it to your people, that they, O Lord, might understand your truth, and that, Lord, they might apply it to their lives, that we together, Lord, might give glory and honor to you, as only you deserve. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a young boy, I was very active. I played a lot of sports, uh, did a lot of other things that that young boys do, uh, which also meant that I got a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. And usually these bumps and bruises would go away with time or, you know, you could just uh, walk it off uh, and after a short time be able to return to whatever activity Uh, I was engaged in. But there were a few times when just walking it off uh, didn't quite cut it, and a doctor would be required to uh, diagnose what was going on or what happened. And I remember one injury in particular uh, that happened um, uh, in my youth uh, in a basketball game, and uh, I landed on my ankle uh, wrong, and I was in a, in a lot of pain. And, you know, those of you who've played sports, basketball, uh, perhaps in particular, know, you know, that landing on your ankle uh, happens, uh, wrongly on your ankle happens uh, once in a while. And uh, usually, again, right, you can just walk it off and, uh, you know, maybe go easy on it for a while, favor it a bit, and uh, eventually you'll be fine. And so that's how I tried to treat uh, this particular injury, although uh, this one hurt a little more and uh, started to swell. And so I uh, put some ice on it and, uh, you know, put it up and, and didn't play the rest of that game. Uh, I went home. It was on a, a Friday, and uh, we were actually headed out of town to go see uh, family. And so uh, we just kind of figured we'll, we'll keep an eye on it and uh, see how it goes. And so I walked very gingerly on it uh, that weekend, but noticed as the weekend progressed that it was starting to discolor and the pain was not exactly going away. And so on Monday, uh, we went to the doctor. Uh, the doctor took a look at it, uh, asked some questions, uh, you know, wanted to see if I could, you know, make certain movements and said, well, you need it. We need to do an x-ray on that ankle Uh, and took the x-ray. And then the doctor brought me into uh, his office. And you all know the feeling, don't you? The doctor's uh, analysis is is complete. And now the time has come to share uh, his, his diagnosis and treatment plan and I know, you know, some of you have gone through this on a much grander scale than just a hurt ankle. But uh, in my case, as a young boy, this was a very anxious moment for me. And then the doctor shared 
his diagnosis. He said, you have a broken ankle and you'll need to wear a cast and you won't be able to play uh, the rest of this basketball season or a significant part of the upcoming baseball season. And of course, to a young boy, this was uh, a crushing, devastating thing to not be able to do those things that I loved to do. But it also, I think, illustrated a couple of points uh, to me, uh, which I've learned, I hope, over time. And that is uh, just that just treating the symptoms, the immediate pain, putting ice on it, walking it off, or trying to, doesn't right always deal with or, or address the real problem. And secondly, right, that ignoring the problem won't make it go away. And in many ways, I mention this because this is what James shows us in our passage this morning, that we, God's people, have a very real problem that needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with in the right way. It needs to be dealt with according to God's wisdom. And so let us look together at God's wisdom, God's word from James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. This is the word of the Lord. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Well, this is the word of our God. Thanks be to God for His holy and inerrant word. So once again, we have some strong words from James for or to the church uh, to whom he is writing, right? The, the, the 12 tribes in the dispersion, the church that is scattered throughout the world. And once again, right, he's addressing a problem that exists in the church, a barrier, if you will, to uh, their and our progress and, and growth in grace. And it's not difficult as we make our way through the book of James to see the connection between uh, what James has uh, just written at the end of chapter 3 and what he continues to talk about here at the beginning of chapter 4, right? And in, in chapter 3, verse 13, he, he asked, right, who is wise and understanding among you? And then uh, proceeded to show us how worldly wisdom contrasts with godly wisdom, right? He explored both the, the source of these two types of wisdom, right? That, that, that earthly wisdom is earthly. It's unspiritual. It's demonic, as he described, right? Ultimately, its source is from uh, the devil himself, the, the father of lies. But godly wisdom, on the other hand, is from above. It's from God. It is founded upon the truth of God, the, the truth that He has revealed to us in His Word. And, and James described it as pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy 
and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And he also showed us, right, the result of these two kinds of wisdom. The godly wisdom leads to peace and a harvest of righteousness, but earthly wisdom leads to jealousy and selfish ambition and disorder and every vile practice. And so here in chapter 4, James seems to take us a little deeper into the, the disorder that earthly wisdom can bring, can, can wreak even and particularly on the church. And so he provides us here with two things. Number one, the diagnosis of our deadly disorder, and secondly, the redemptive remedy for our trouble. And these will serve as our two points uh, today. So first, the, de- the diagnosis of our deadly disorder. In verse 1, James asks a question, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Apparently, this was a problem in the church in James's time and, right, in every time in the history of the church, uh, that there is conflict that is going on. And so James is asking that question to his readers, but it is a, a question that all of God's people throughout history and certainly today must reflect upon. What is it that causes such conflict? And given what he has already been saying in this letter, the answer uh, perhaps should be somewhat obvious. Uh, Now, most likely, uh, Sinclair Ferguson notes this, when when we distinguish between quarrels and, and, and fights, right? Quarrels are probably talking about those uh, ongoing, those, those long-term conflicts that might exist within the church, and, and fights, on the other hand, are the more um, uh, immediate, the, those flare-ups that, uh, you know, might happen on occasion. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, both are a problem, James is showing us, and the, right, the, the reality is that both of these things are happening in the church, right? And, and, and notice what he says. He says, what causes quarrels and fights among you, among those to whom I'm writing? Not, you know, what causes quarrels and fights out there in the world among random people in random places, but among you, among the people of God. And of course, right, the, the point is, this is not the way things ought to be. So why is it that this is still going on even within the church of God, the family of God. Right, James is saying we need to get to the root of the problem so that we can treat it appropriately. And again, Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson, points out that the symptom that James is identifying is quarreling and, and fighting. But we need to get deeper than that. What is it that causes quarrels and fights, even among brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, he answers it for us, doesn't he? He answers with these words, Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your passions... It's the word hedone, which means what it sounds like, hedonism, right? That it has to do with our loss, our pleasure that we seek, right? The, the overwhelming desire that we seem to have to fulfill our own selfish desires, right? Those, those things that well up in us, 
especially, of course, when we live according to the wisdom of the world, which we talked about last week, right? When we are seeking those things that, that please us, bring us pleasure, when we put our own interests above everything else and everyone else in our lives, when we say in our hearts, I want the things that I want, and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get them no matter what I need to do, right? Whether they are material things, material possessions, whether they are the, right, the, the lust of the eyes, the, the boastful pride of life, whether it's the adoration and respect of others, and of course, we don't care how it affects everyone else around us. But not necessarily does it have to be these overt examples either, right? It can be anything that is an expression of ultimately what is selfish behavior, the, the subtle things, right? Like seeking after a life of ease, right? Avoiding, you know, getting our hands dirty with other people's problems, carving out a little me time so that I don't have to deal with my responsibilities and obligations to others. You know, and like we talked about last week, this isn't to say that we can't have any, you know, desires or that, you know, we can't have any uh, downtime uh, in our lives. But what James is driving us toward repeatedly throughout this book is what is the motivation for why we do what we do? What is the motivation of our hearts? Why do we seek the things we seek? Because if we do those things, no matter what they might be, even, you know, good things, if they are driven by our selfish desires, our selfish ambitions. Ultimately, they will lead us to destruction, right? I mean, what happens, right, when, when we don't get what we want? Well, James describes it for us here in verses 2 and following. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, perhaps it's obvious that James is, is using the word murder here figuratively, um, right? It's, it's expressing uh, the idea that Jesus did in Matthew chapter 5, right? That if you are angry with your brother, that you are committing, <clears throat> excuse me, you are committing murder in your heart. You see, when we desire what someone else has, what our brother or sister in Christ has, when we, when we covet it and, and wish that it were ours instead of theirs, so, right? so, so, so that we become you know, so bitterly jealous, what James is saying is that we are really committing murder in our hearts. How? Because when we covet after that which someone else has, there's a sense in which we are wishing that person was dead so that we could have it. And James is, is saying, brothers and sisters, this is what is ultimately in your heart when you quarrel and, and fight about these things, and it's not supposed to be this way. And it's important to understand what James is saying there at the end of, of the verse when he says, it's, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And I, I know we've already talked about this, but he's pointing out that the problem is within you, right? The problem is not everybody else. The problem is not all the influences in the world around us, those things that impact our lives. 
The root of our problems, James is pointing out, resides within us. It resides within our own heart. We fight and quarrel. We can't get along, James is saying, because we're selfish. Because we can't see beyond our own concerns. Right? We're like little children who are constantly bickering over toys and right who always want what the other person has instead of what they have and when they don't get what they want they throw a fit but then he goes a little further doesn't he he says you don't have or you do not have because you do not ask you ask And do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And here we see how our selfish desires can actually even penetrate and do actually even penetrate our prayer life. James is saying, first, we don't pray as we ought. We're not faithful in in bringing our concerns before the Lord, trusting Him to work things out according to His plan and His purpose and His time. But also, right, even when we do pray, we don't pray with the right motives. We have corrupt motives, James says. We, We pray for our own ends, our own selfish desires. And we're not satisfied with God's answers to our prayers, right? When we don't get what we want, when we want it. And James is pointing out, right, that even in our best, even when we're praying, we can be characterized motivated with self-service. But finally, James offers his, his diagnosis. And it's worse than we might have expected. You know, going back to my own experience as a, as a, as a young lad with my broken ankle... I remember being there in the doctor's office and I was crushed that I wouldn't be able to play sports and at least for a while and uh, and and that was that was hard but then he went on with the diagnosis and he explained that I hadn't just fractured my ankle I had fractured the growth plate in my ankle which as a young person who is in is growing is is not a good thing to do it was much more concerning about that aspect than anything that it could indeed affect my physical development it was treatable thankfully but not something that we would want to have left unaddressed for very long and while this is a a mild example of how a diagnosis can be far worse than we might uh, originally think. The same is true here in James's diagnosis of the church's problem in, in chapter 4. He points out that indeed our condition is, is far worse than we think. Our, our selfishness and self-centeredness is, is deep-rooted. But thankfully, it is treatable through Christ, through His redemptive work, which we'll get to in a moment. But notice His diagnosis in verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do you see what He's saying here? He's saying, the reason... The, the core, if you will, of why you have fights and quarrels among you is because you've given your heart to someone else. 
Yes, it may have started out uh, as an innocent friendship, but then it developed into something more. And at some point along the way, you started to desire to be with that other person than with your first love. And then he's saying you let your desire for that other person develop to the point that you began to even hate the one to whom you truly belong. You've begun, James is saying, to love the world, the things of the world, the wisdom of the world. You've bought into the world's way of thinking about things, about life. You've believed the devil's lie that you don't need God, that you know what's best for you. That's why you have fights and quarrels among you. James is saying, you've committed spiritual adultery, dear Christians. You've given yourself to that other love. And these things must not be among the people of God. And so as we hear James's words here, is we're, we are faced with the question, aren't we? What are those things in our lives that we have actually prioritized over God? What are those things? What are those those pleasures that if we were honest, we would admit that we enjoy more than God Himself? Is it our material possessions? Is it our reputation? Is it our our leisure time? Is it simply being able to do what we want to do when we want to do it and not have anybody else tell us differently? to, To be the captain of our own ship as it were. You see, our condition is far worse than we originally thought. We are, we are self-absorbed. We are adulterous sinners, unable to overcome our desires. But there is hope, isn't there? And James points us to this, that God's solution is far greater still. And that brings us to our second point, the redemptive remedy to our trouble. Verse 5 says this, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us? Now when we read that quotation, some of you might be wondering, where, where do I find that? that passage in in the Bible, and the answer is that you won't, at least not uh, word for word. Uh, Rather, what what seems to be going on here is much like uh, the prophecy about Jesus uh, in Matthew uh, 2.23, if you may remember, right, when it says He went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that He'd be called a Nazarene. Um, that you you don't find a specific verse that that is referring to, but it's capturing a a biblical teaching, right? Rather than quoting a specific text. And that is what James is doing here. He's summarizing a a teaching of of Scripture. And uh, it seems that he is drawing here on passages like Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, which says, You shall not bow down to them, speaking of of idols, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Or Deuteronomy 4.24, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And it's important when we talk about the, the jealousy of God for us that we understand what this kind of jealousy is, right? It is not uh, the, you know, petty jealousy that we are uh, more familiar with, right? The, the bitter jealousy that uh, James uh, talks about because of our, our coveting uh, what others have, right? Because of our selfish desires and so on. But rather, 
When we read about the jealousy of God, I think Sinclair Ferguson does a good job of explaining this. He says the jealousy of God is different. It is the proper zeal to possess what rightly belongs to Him. It's the jealousy that only true love and pure love knows. To possess the loved one entirely and to do so for their good and blessing. Right? In other words, when we understand the, the jealousy of God that is spoken about in Scripture, we understand that it is the deep love of God for His people, His sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, right? His, his love for those whom He has created in His image, whom He has restored, redeemed, in Jesus Christ. And so James is reminding us here of who God is. That He is our Creator and our Redeemer. That He does have a great love for us. And that He is righteously jealous for us, for our good and His glory. And of course, when we understand this great love that God has for us as His people, it, it, it makes us ask the question, how and why would we ever give ourselves to another? Why would we ever believe the lie that God does not care for us? That He is somehow holding something back from us and we need to go get it ourselves. Why would we ever think anything other than the truth that God so loved us that He sent His only Son? But then He goes on in verse 6, and here He, he quotes a passage that we can find in the Old Testament. He says, uh, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that last phrase there comes from Proverbs 3.34. But it expresses that fundamental biblical truth that we find throughout Scripture that God is gracious, right? As Exodus 34, 6 and 7 says, The Lord, the go Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. You see, James wants his readers to understand that the cure for their disease is to understand, first of all, who God is. That God is a God who loves us. God is the one who has shown His grace to us beyond what we could ever hope or imagine. And He does so because so often when we stray, when we follow after false gods, when we follow after the things of this world, when we believe the lies of the enemy, why do we do that? We do that because we have forgotten. We fail to believe that God is who He says He is, that He has revealed Himself to be and who He has proved Himself to be over and over and over again. And so James is saying, don't forget this. God is loving. God is gracious. But he also reminds us of something else here, and that is our need to repent. Our need to turn from our sin and trust in God's amazing grace once again, he's in verse 7 and following, he says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. And in these words, we hear a number of images, really, from the Old Testament scriptures, the, the story of redemption. We, we hear the, the ceremonial washings, right? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, James says. And we're reminded of the requirement of God's people to be cleansed before drawing near to God in the temple in worship. We hear the language of the garden, or at least what we might say should have been the language in the garden, which Adam and Eve failed to do when we hear these words, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Rather than what we saw in Genesis 3, when they drew near to the serpent, and believed his lies, and then hid from God when God called for them. And finally, he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. That's the language of repentance. That is the language of recognizing that we have failed to give God the proper place the proper honor and authority in our lives, the honor and authority that only belongs to Him. This is the language of turning away from ourselves and from our own selfish desires and looking to the one, the only one, who can deliver us from our helpless Estate. And notice, right, the bookends of, of verses 7 and 10, when he says, Submit yourselves therefore to God in verse 7, and then in verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. It's a call, isn't it? To bow the knee before the Lord, to recognize his proper place in all things, to remove ourselves or anything else other than God from that place of prominence in our lives. To reject the lies of the enemy and to remember and know that precious truth that though our sin is great, God's grace is greater still. You see, brothers and sisters, Christ has drawn near to us. He has done everything necessary for us to not only make our hands clean, but to clean us from the inside out entirely. Because He has entered the holy place once for all to offer Himself as the eternal sacrifice so that Sinners like you and me might know the love, the grace, the mercy, and the nearness of God forevermore by grace through faith in Him. So let us receive the diagnosis that we have been given, the diagnosis that God provides and let us submit ourselves to the precious remedy that he has given us to our fallen condition through Jesus Christ so that our weeping would be turned to laughter and our sorrow will be turned to joy forevermore in Christ alone let's pray Oh, gracious God, we are grateful once again for the glorious grace that you give us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we confess that we are a selfish, self-centered people who are constantly looking out for our own interests. 
instead of the interests of others. Help us, Lord, to turn away from that, to turn to you, the, the one who gave himself up for us so that we might be forgiven, that we might have life in you forevermore, and that we might know the love, the grace, and the hope that can be found in Jesus Christ alone. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand now for the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.